Kavia. Portmanteau of Computer Amusement Visualizer, Kavia is a game studio that was founded in Tokyo in March of 2000 and closed a mere decade later in 2010. In that short time, they released what I believe to be some of the most creatively interesting games of their era. I personally hold Kavia in very high regard. They're one of my favorite studios. Kavia had a knack for punching well above their weight. Most of their output were the kinds of games I love most, games whose ambitions exceed their meager budgets made by people whose talents and ideas surpass the necessary limitations of time and resources availed to them. They are the undisputed virtuosos of the fabled 7 out of 10 game. Kavia games are distinctive in a handful of key ways that endear them to me as holistic sensory experiences. They were masters of kinesthetics. Combat in a good Kavia game always feels excellent in the hands. They're satisfyingly crunchy, like cracking a glow stick or stepping on dry leaves. They knew exactly when and how to freeze the screen on impact for a few frames. They knew how to make snappy sounds that popped out of your speakers and particle effects that seemed to jump off the screen. Kavia wasn't necessarily concerned with making huge commercial hits. As is the case for many studios of their size, they made a lot of games on contract for existing licenses and publishers, not unlike what Treasure did. But they took their work seriously and poured a lot of heart into each release. That heart shines through all of the surface-level presentational elements that betray each game's respective budgetary limitations, imbuing them with a distinct personality and sense of style. There exists an unspoken conversation between player and designer in games, some more than others, and in many of Kavia's games that conversation is distinct and colorful, but it melds into the background and stays there, leaving the player with a vague and often unconscious awareness that they're experiencing something that someone made for them. Some of their highlights include games like Drakengard, Drakengard 2, the PS2 adaptations of Ghost in the Shell and Steam Boy, Beat Down Fists of Vengeance, don't sleep on that one, the sequel to Winback, Project Poseidon, Bullet Witch, that core DS10 app, the Wii port of Sega Bass Fishing, those Resident Evil light gun games on the Wii, and of course, the legendary game that seemingly bankrupted the company, Nier. Annex even had them make a Dragon Quest mystery dungeon game in Japan. And don't forget everyone's favorite, the generically renamed Wii adaptation of Hajime no Ito, Victorious Boxer's Revolution. Available now for your Nintendo revolution, presumably? Gun Survivor is a series of light gun games acting as spin-offs of the Resident Evil franchise, save for the third entry which is themed after sister series Dino Crisis. But our topic today is the fourth and final release to bear the Gun Survivor moniker, 2003's Gun Survivor 4 Biohazard, Heroes Never Die, known more commonly in the West as Resident Evil Dead Aim. I would love to go into all kinds of detail about this game and the production of it and the level of creative involvement or direction from Capcom to Kavia, but frankly there's just very little information out there from what I can find. Despite carrying the weight of a massive IP, there's not a lot of interest or discussion about the game in general online, regardless of language, which is part of why I wanted to talk about it. It's a weird little game that I have a tremendous amount of affection for, to the degree that I've spent what is arguably an irresponsible amount of time and money and energy, none of which are resources I have in any kind of great abundance, producing this video about it. <laughs> um, but I am nothing if not consistent. Uh, <laughs> this is a janky PS2 game with a lot of really cool ideas that's desperately rough around the edges. I am Andrew Elmore and this is Mythic Resonance. Hit him with a late title card. Resident Evil Dead Aim is a very familiar game that's also like nothing I've ever played. We talk a lot about structure here, right? The sort of step-by-step -step player experience of a game considered holistically. And structurally speaking, Dead Aim is a Resident Evil-ass Resident Evil game. In spite of appearances, it's still a third-person survival horror game wherein you explore a zombie-infested sea mansion in the form of a cruise ship elegantly dubbed Spencer Rain. <laughs> owned and operated by everybody's favorite paramilitary pharmaceutical provider, say that five times fast, the Umbrella Corporation. 
You don't want to know how many takes that took. You'll slink and skulk your way through dark hallways, collecting herbs, solving puzzles, and managing limited resources as you do a bunch of Metroid things around a densely layered map. You'll fight zombies, hunters, and eventually a big lumbering tyrant shortly before the ship Titanic's face first into an iceberg, and you conveniently escape to a nearby underground laboratory full of secret bioweapon experiments designed explicitly for you to shoot a whole lot of guns at. Then everything explodes and you escape safely roll the new metal credits. If you've played most any survival horror game, particularly any Resident Evil, this is like walking around the streets of the town you grew up in. More things have changed. More things have stayed the same. This is a dialect of a language you probably already speak. But Dead Aim stands out by being a bit more experimental and how it asks the player to interact with a familiar structure because Dead Aim is played entirely with a light gun. Specifically, Namco's Guncon 2. Reload. The Guncon 2 is an evolution of the Guncon 1 from the PS1. Go figure. Adding a few buttons, as well as crucially, a directional pad. In Dead Aim, you hold the light gun essentially like you would any controller, moving your character around the environment with the D-pad. You interact with the world using the big old buttons on the side and squeeze the trigger to enter a first-person shooting mode. When your weapon is readied, it becomes a modal de facto light gun game. You raise the gun con to the screen, take aim, and fire. You can pivot left and right 360 degrees with the D-pad, which is especially useful when you're being swarmed by enemies from multiple directions, which is entirely possible if you're not being especially careful. If you've ever been frustrated watching people waste a bunch of ammo in a panic in a zombie movie, <laughs> now's your chance. Granted, the gun is plastic and the danger imaginary, but the philosophical relationship of plastic peripherals to their real-world counterparts is a bit outside the scope of this video. Ever play Guitar Hero? Anyway, in this mode, you squeeze the trigger to shoot whatever weapon you have equipped, press the B button to reload like you're slapping a fresh magazine into the gun con, and simply start walking forward and backward to the D-pad to exit this view and go back to free third-person movement. Kafia's strengths really shine here, I think. Every one of these actions is quick and snappy with an arcade-esque crunchability. <laughs> The instantaneous shift between the refined formula of Resident Evil's quiet exploration and the pulse-pounding panic of House of the Dead's ever-advancing hordes is Dead Aim's unspoken thesis statement as a creative work. Survival horror means that the threat of violence against your digital avatar is always on the table, but when that potential energy becomes kinetic and the ambient danger becomes direct confrontation, Dead Aim means to see you, the player, physically have to do something about it. Dead Aim says that if you want to survive, you're going to raise your meaty analog arms and squeeze the trigger yourself as many times as it takes, with your figurative head on a literal swivel at all times. It's a brilliant way, I think, to extrapolate the artifice of video games and their inherent need for interactivity and user input out of one of their major layers of abstraction while keeping the core experience rooted in the familiar sensory language that we're used to engaging with them. Another effect of that modality is the way that it anchors a willing player down deep in the game's strong, if simple, sense of place. If there's one thing you're likely to have ever heard about this game, it's that it's got atmosphere for days, dude. Atmosphere, vibes, whatever you want to call it, Dead Aim's got it down deep in its DNA. To say that Kavya's got that sort of thing down to his science would, I think, be doing a disservice to both Kavya and science. None of their games have given me the impression that their overall vibe, so to speak, is due to intensely researched specifics or laser-focused detail obsession in the environment. Quite the opposite, in fact. That's not to say that it looks like an accident, but rather that they simply make it look effortless. Like it just sort of happens. Not intentionally, not accidentally, but naturally. Organically. They knew what they were doing, and their vision is crystallized in the final product, perceived flaws and all. Their development history is a story of tight turnaround times and even tighter budgets, meaning they can allot just enough time and resources to be able to communicate exactly what needs to be communicated about any given space, and little if any more. I know nothing about the internal culture of Kavia, much less their labor practices in 2003, but my impressions of any game can't help but be informed by my own experience in game development, and I'm inclined to believe that you don't make a Resident Evil game this thick with emotive tone and moody atmosphere without, at the very least, excellent art direction and immensely talented staff. I mean, I know that goes without saying, but I feel 
Like, it's a very specific fork of all those things in this case. So let's talk tone. Resident Evil Dead Aim is a dark game. I'm not speaking allegorically, I mean that in the most literal visual sense. Some of that might be obvious from the footage in this video, but keep in mind this game is over 20 years old and uses a light gun, which means it was intended to be played on a CRT, where the black levels are functionally infinite. If you're watching this on an OLED, you probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm referring to, but even then, this footage was captured... Okay, here we go. From real hardware over RGB through a retro Tink 5X into a portable capture card where it got compressed to MP4 at the highest bit rate I can financially afford to provide you, and then it found its way into this video project in DaVinci Resolve, where it was exported, encoded, and compressed, then uploaded to YouTube, where it was compressed and re-encoded again, then compressed yet again as it was streamed from Google servers to your device, where it is being decoded by whatever app or browser you're using, with the color space being converted to your display panel, which is statistically speaking probably not derived from a cathode ray tube, though shout out if it is. So bear with me here. <laughs> I think I got all the steps right. Large swaths of this game take place in different sections of a functionally derelict cruise ship and the rest take place in a functionally derelict underground lab. You'll be spending a lot of time in places where the power is out is what I'm saying. Occasionally you'll get some classic red emergency backup generator lights, but for the most part it's dark rooms and halls lit only by your character's meager flashlight. This is a game where I find myself maneuvering and navigating largely by an internalized memory of the space rather than by sight. Particularly so on subsequent playthroughs since Resident Evil Dead Aim is only about two or three hours long, so it doesn't give you too many wildly different floor plans to memorize. But it's worth noting that this is an experiential consideration I noticed even in my first playthrough. Although I did keep nervously double checking my map throughout the game, but that's distinctly a me problem, I promise. <laughs> Gun Survivor 4 Biohazard Heroes Never Die is as quiet as it is dark. There's a lot of great audio work in the game, but the majority of it is UI and footsteps. Either your own or those of the shambling undead that you share these shadowy corridors with. Even the places themselves feel like life itself calmly left them behind to languish in inanimate obscurity. Which is to say, dead aim, more like dead game! But the places do feel dead. Much like any good Metroid game, dead aim is a setting wherein the player, for whom this digital world was ostensibly created, is an inherently intrusive presence in this interconnected series of industrialized complexes, in this case belonging both formally and exclusively to the unwillingly undead. It's even crowned by what I think is the coolest save room music in the series. There are so many details and emergent possibilities crammed into this bad boy that if I wanted to talk about all of them, it would be easier to just do a full length, no commentary let's play video. And those exist. But there are a few themes that Kavya chose to focus on here that I think are worth analyzing, if only to paint a more detailed overview of what this game is and is not interested in. Since the original game Spencer Mansion setting in 1996, Resident Evil has traded in the aestheticization of entrenched wealth and the way that it decays, to the point that when the seventh mainline numbered game in the series was tasked with playing the role of a soft reboot of sorts, one of the primary ways it differentiated itself and established its own identity was to make a concentrated rejection of that wealth, exploring instead a cartoonish caricature of generational poverty in the American South, by way of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, True Detective Season 2, all these other cultural media touchpoints that people were referring to when covering the game back when it released in 2017, but this game released in 2003. Back then, Resident Evil was a handful of goofy, spooky games about increasingly elaborate haunted houses. This mansion is gigantic. The first of those houses was a pretty sweet home, but Spencer Mansion is a mansion. 2002's remake of that first game doubles down on that old money architecture and decor so intently that you can practically smell the dust on the rugs in the entryway. RE2's police station is a repurposed art museum of marble and mahogany. RE3 sees Umbrella's financial grip on Raccoon City's leadership and infrastructure lead directly to mass destruction. 
Dead Aim starts in a huge, ornate cruise ship that echoes the woodworked flourishes of Spencer Mansion and ends in an underground lab with a state-of-the-art bioweapons research facility and an entire missile silo. Resident Evil has always had very real, genuine concerns about unregulated big pharma manipulating market forces in the United States and the way that the population here is held hostage by a deliberately hostile for-profit healthcare system, as well as the ways the US government feeds and maintains the global military-industrial complex at the expense of human life and societal well-being. Umbrella's flexible role in the fiction as a pharmaceutical megacorporation engaging in secretive apocalyptic bioweapons research allows the series to explore and indeed raise a dissenting voice in frustrated anger, while holding to a core identity as a series of playable B-movies with delightfully goofy plots and characters. They can have fun being silly and ridiculous and wallowing in the camp of genre aesthetics and horror tropes, but at the end of the day, the root of every utterance like complete global saturation in Resident Evil's canon is still an expertly ham-fisted allusion to the dangers inherent to a global economic system, reliance on the accumulation of capital and individualism above all else, to the detriment of all else. As wildly silly as Deadheim is at all times, the story of Resident Evil as a whole is, as I read it, one of frustration against an impossibly massive system that's designed to be too broken to help anybody and seemingly too large to be defeated before it's too late for us all. These games always feel to me like the ludic expression of throwing a brick at a brick wall. A desperate cry of righteous fury against a system of violence and oppression that's too large, too powerful, and too deeply entrenched for any of its victims to stand up against. At least that's been my emotional experience with the series. Speaking of crusty camp, Dead Aim's got it by the truckload. This is the goofiest dialogue since the first game, maybe even more so, made even better by the subtitles and voice acting being completely different expressions of localization to the point that almost none of the lines delivered by the characters match the text in the subtitles. That alarm can't be any good. Any idea what it's for? Look! Oh no! It's like constantly getting two different drafts of the same script outline from different writers. It's almost too much and too little to talk about, because every time someone is talking, it's at least partially ridiculous, but it's also a short game, so there's not a ton of gold here necessarily. Suffice it to say that you play as US government agent Bruce McGivern and Chinese government agent Fong Ling, then Revolver Sephirocelot shows up every so often to loosely set up some kind of vague commentary on gender expression that is never ever remarked upon by anybody a scared little rat with an ugly useless gun before transforming into a giant tetsuo flesh mass and getting vaporized by another failed spacex rocket more or less sorry but my dance card is full Oh, I've gone really far into this without so much as a plot synopsis. Okay, let me try and sum it up for you really quick. Assuming you have some base understanding of 
Resident Evil, because I can't start from zero here. We'd be here all day. Okay. Within the Umbrella Corporation was an employee of dubious rank named Morpheus Duval. <laughs> I'll pause for applause, because that name is... good. M Morpheus? Duval is something of an ethno-fascist bioterrorist archetype that's less of a person and more of a collection of anthropomorphized tropes and a proverbial trench coat. During the research, Duval becomes pathologically obsessed with the idea of min-maxing the inherently subjective nature of beauty on a cellular level. Umbrella sees an opportunity to pin the events of the Raccoon City outbreak on a weird new type of guy that just dropped, so that's exactly what they do. Morpheus seizes the opportunity to go rogue, stealing variants of the infamous T-Virus from an Umbrella lab in Paris, and taking command of the Spencer Rain cruise ship, as well as all of the wealthy elite members of high society that were aboard as hostages. To say nothing of the crew and service class laborers and workers that were already on the ship making it function. Morpheus holds the world at ransom, threatening both the Chinese and American governments, demanding a payout of one billion dollars or else firing a series of T-Virus-equipped ICBMs at major population centers in both countries. Each country sends in one agent to secretly board the Spencer Range, just the one, and find a way to solve the problems from the inside, so to speak. China sends in their own agent, Feng Ling, from the Ministry of State Security. The American government has apparently developed an entire strike force for handling Umbrella's shenanigans at this point called a U.S. Stratcom, which is where our cornball agent of hapless himboism, Bruce McGivern, comes in. But by the time they both arrive, the entire ship has already been thoroughly infected with the T-Virus. It's zombies all the way down, baby. Before too long, some video game explosions happen, Morpheus gets wounded and elects to self-inject an experimental variant TG virus, and then it's Mighty Morphin Morpheus time for the rest of the game. <laughs> At some point, the Chinese government decides to just pay the ransom and tries to incinerate their own agent with some kind of orbital weapons platform. Nothing left to lose, she teams up with Bruce and his dorky We Have Ethan Hawke in the late 90s at home goatee, and they blow everything up and save the world together. The end. Gotcha, gotcha! You play most of the game as Bruce, switching to Fong Ling a handful of times at a few narrative moments. The difference between them is purely aesthetic. They have separate inventories, so make sure to watch your ammo counts, but that's about it. After you've completed the game once, you can swap characters and play it again. That's what I did through footage here, thinking maybe there was some small chance that there might be some other content here. I don't know why I didn't just look it up, but no, it just swaps the character models, meaning that you play as Fong Ling during Bruce's portions of the game and vice versa, and then they're switched back to normal for the cutscenes, which can be a little bit jarring at times, but it makes enough sense. So most of my footage from this most recent playthrough with the new capture equipment shows Fong Ling during the parts where you'd normally play as Bruce for, but that's my only production note here. Also, fun fact, because this game used Namco's Gun Con 2, Bruce and Fong Ling both appear in the Japan-only PS2 game Namco Cross Capcom, representing the Resident Evil series. Not Jill, not Leon, not Chris, Claire, Barry, or even Wesker. Nope. Ling and McGivern, everyone's favorite RE characters. <laughs> Nakamura Manufacturing Company Cross Capsule Computers would go on to receive a pair of spiritual successors on the 3DS called a Project Cross Zone that did release stateside. I have no idea if our beloved heroes are in there or not. I don't think so. I have both of these games, and I do intend to check them out eventually, but I haven't yet. Look, man, there are a lot of video games. I can't play them all, but I could try. I probably got, what, a good 50-ish years left in me, assuming the best, maybe 60 if I'm super lucky. As long as no one else releases any more media for the rest of my days, maybe I'll have enough time to get through most of the movies I want to watch and find some time to squeeze in a few PS1 RPGs here and there. Heroes may never die, but I sure will. 
eventually. What was I talking about? Okay, we have to address the 200 pound cathode ray tube in the room. Specifically, this one. This 36 inch Trinitron I played Dead Aim on. With it being a light gun game, the reality is that you aren't going to have the same experience that I did without a standard def CRT television. For a variety of reasons, traditional light guns don't work on modern displays. There are a few more recent projects in the retro game scene making attempts to find solutions and workarounds for this problem, but none of them yet, to my knowledge, have covered PS2 games. At least not at the time of this video's production. It is possible to play Dead Aim without a light gun, but I can't recommend it in good conscience. Using a normal controller, you can walk around and interact with the environment just like any Resi game, but when it comes time to fire a weapon, you have to manually scoot the cursor around the screen to aim, and acceleration curves for making analog stick aiming feel natural like they do today hadn't really been widely solved yet at the time, so it feels very stiff and powerfully imprecise. It's also much, much slower. If you're emulating, there are input plugins for PCSX2 that will let you use a mouse for a light gun, which certainly makes the game more playable, but it's a fundamentally different experience from controlling the whole game with a plastic gun that you then raise and aim as zombies on the screen with your physical arms. But hey, if you want to check the game out and you don't have the necessary hardware, necessary, a suboptimal experience is usually better than no experience at all. This is one case where the physicality of the experience was a defining factor for me, but I'm always going to be in favor of new solutions to make old games more accessible to a broader range of people. While the other Gun Survivor games play with the experience of character movement and exploration within the context of a light gun style experience, nothing that I've ever seen or played comes particularly close to doing quite what Dead Aim does with the concept. Not even Kavya's later light gun style Resident Evil games on the Wii, or their HD ports on the PS3 really make a play at this style of game, which is kind of unfortunate. At least to me, selfishly, I feel like the Wii would have been a perfect platform to try something like this again, since the console's primary control device is already basically a gun con with an analog stick, but I'm not sure if the emotional connection that I have to Dead Aim would be affected by removing its unique status as a game unlike any other. At least a portion of my appreciation for the game is rooted in its inherent novelty. But then, being different or innovative is part of what makes any art special. I think I might have just posed a question that even I don't have the energy to pose a long-winded answer for. <laughs> At least not yet, anyway. But in the meantime, divorced from navel-gazy thought experiments, the fact remains that I've never played anything quite like Resident Evil Dead Aim. And I love it. It has a beautifully gloomy atmosphere, exceptionally well-considered mechanical design, it's gleefully stupid, and we're probably never going to see anything like it ever again. Until then, I'll see you on the other side of Enderzone. Take care.